So a little bit about the um, history. Um, there is has always been a connection between the UK and Bordeaux because of uh, the historical relationship. It did actually belong to England at one point because of the marriage between Ella and Aquitaine to um, Henry Plantagenet. And because of where Bordeaux is situated on the Atlantic Ocean and with rivers, it was very easy to do, um, have very good trade relations uh, with the area and with uh, England. You will probably know that there are lots of English, Scottish, Irish names um, in Bordeaux stemmed from this particular uh, period of time. Even though in the 15th century, France regained um, control of Aquitaine uh, and the trade diminished a little bit um, with England and developed more with the Dutch. In fact, the Dutch were really influential in how Bordeaux has turned out even today is a lot down to, uh, thanks to the Dutch and what they did there, which we'll go into a little bit or talk a little bit as we, we go along. This um, river, the uh, Garonne and the Gironde Estuary and the Garonne River, really crucial for the winemaking, but also for the trade development and Caribbean, but also worldwide, um, really useful situation of the city. In the 19th century, there was a lot of investment into uh, research for um, against vine disease, uh, mildew, powdew, powdery mildew, and also um, phylloxera. Obviously, Bordeaux was affected like every other uh, vineyard area in uh, Europe in the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century with phylloxera, but survived. Um, and uh, in 1948, the CIVB, the, the Bordeaux Wine Board was developed, which um, it does education like uh, like today, but also marketing, research, um, and also controlling the vineyards to make sure that people are working as they should. So it's a really important organisation in anything to do with wine in, in Bordeaux. Um, basically, Bordeaux is the biggest um, AOC area in um, France with um, 111,000 hectares. When I started working with Bordeaux, you'd be looking at 120,000 hectares of vineyards. It's decreased. And to my mind, that's a very good thing because it means that the vineyards that weren't doing what they should are no longer in existence. So they are looking constantly at producing the better, the best wine they can, certainly better uh, than in the past and certainly I would definitely say today that Bordeaux is producing better wine than it ever has. That's probably true of a lot of wine regions because you know we know how to make better quality wine, we know how to work the vineyards um, in different uh, climates, different weather conditions etc. But it's quite interesting to put it into perspective with uh, the other vineyard um, areas in France. We look at Burgundy which is so uh, well known and how small it is a third of what uh, Bordeaux produces. So it has an interesting way of working in Bordeaux, um, just under 6,000 wine growers. Again, this was double that number when I first started working with Bordeaux. So again, it's decreasing. It's hard work to make a good living in Bordeaux, but the, still over half of the uh, wine estates are family run. Um, and what happens in Bordeaux, a lot of people will grow grapes, want to make their own wine, but they do it via a cooperative or else they will send their wine um, via a broker to a merchant who will brand it themselves. Increasingly, you'll find people going now directly to the merchants or even directly to the market. Uh, Bordeaux is important as an export um, product, uh, always has been. Obviously, it's still um, more consumed in France, but 44% is very high for an export um, market. And the top three now are China, USA and Belgium. Population of Belgium is about 11 and a half million. So they do really well drinking all that Bordeaux. We used to be up there. The UK used to definitely be up there in volume and value. And if you look at value, Hong Kong has a really high 
um, proportion in terms of uh, value, even bearing in mind that a lot of it comes through the UK. And so the UK market has diminished in favor of places like China and uh, the USA. Bordeaux is diverse. You can see where it is on the world map. Um, but this is the map that is basically Bordeaux and shows why we have such diversity there. We benefit from the Atlantic Ocean, we benefit from the Gironde Estuary, the Dordogne River, the Garonne River, and because it's so large and vast, very many different soil types to allow for different grape varieties to be planted in different styles of wine. Now, any wine that is made in the region of Bordeaux can call itself Bordeaux or Bordeaux Supérieur. If you are making growing grapes, say up here, you've got a bit of Merlot here, you want to blend it with Malbec, you can, you just can't call it by the individual appellation, say Côte de Blois, you must call it Bordeaux. So a lot of the wine um, made in Bordeaux is actually sold as Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur, nearly half in fact. Uh, but there are these um, 60 odd, 65 in total, um, other appellations. And you can see from this map, the little dots signify what they can produce. Red, white, rosé, sweet. And there they all are. So a lot of them will be very familiar to you, such as uh, saint Emilion. Medoc, but maybe things like uh, saint macaire or Haute-Venoge, not quite so familiar, little um, appellations that we don't see a lot of um, in the UK. Much easier to talk about the Bordeaux wine families, so obviously red wine. Now, about 50, 60 years ago, Bordeaux was 50-50 white to red. Uh, now Bordeaux red represents well, we used to say 89% was red and 11 would be white, 2% of which was sweet. But now, of course, we can mention rosé. There is enough that it actually, um, we can talk about it as enough of a percentage. So now we talk about 84% red. Um, so it's still hugely important. And then we have clairé, which I don't know if this is something many of you are familiar with in the UK we hardly see any now sadly it's still made it's still produced but mostly drunk in France and it's a dark rosé a light red that you would drink chilled and it's where we get our name claret from it's the original Bordeaux going back to the 12th century 13th century that's the wine you would have been drinking rosé as I say we're going to talk about rosé later because it is an increasingly important uh, style of wine produced uh, in Bordeaux for me, the white wines of Bordeaux are the most undervalued white wines of the world. And they're quite varied from um, a, a sort of 100% Sauvignon Blanc, unoaked, fresh, aromatic, floral, delicate, to the oak um, aged, blended with Semillon and potentially Muscadel too, um, with a lot of age potential. And I think they, in price go from you know a fiver to maybe 30 pounds mostly they're one or two much more than that um, but really great wines and great value wines sweet wines representing two percent of what bordeaux produces and sadly such a difficult wine to market these days yet yeah, they are delicious talk about those later too and come on um, an exciting really very new thing it Sparkling wine has been made there, but you maybe could have mentioned two or three, and now there's um, many more people producing uh, Cremant. Again, something we will talk about uh, later on. Um, what makes Bordeaux so special? Well, terroir is obviously key. Our terroir being the soil, the climate, the topography, the location. Um, great varieties, we have obviously the classic top great varieties in the world, and then a thousand years of winemaking history. We kind of know what we're doing, even though we are always constantly reviewing that and developing to make better wines. So our favorable, favorable climate, 
uh, which is kind of changing. Definitely there's a um, climate change going on everywhere in the world and we're definitely seeing it in Bordeaux. But this is what we would think of as a classic and good vintage. So lovely hot sunny summers uh, with fine autumns, a little bit of rain but um, basically sunshine not too hot to, to uh, ripen the grapes, the last bit of ripening. Winter frosts, very rare because uh, of being close to the Atlantic Ocean and because of those rivers, very helpful to maintain a temperate maritime climate and um, therefore not really suffering from winter frost. And then of course you get 2017 where Bordeaux suffered like the rest of France. They had winter frost even as far south as the Languedoc Roussillon. So it, we weren't alone. Damp spring, so lovely um, rain just when you need it. And this Gulf Stream um, along the Atlantic coast giving nice temperate climate. So if you've been to Bordeaux, you may have noticed that it rains, may not have been massively hot. It's fairly temperate, which is obviously what you need for that long, um, slow growing period uh, of ripening grapes. This pine forest um, that is mentioned here, this is um, another um, factor that we would now recognize as a natural factor, but it was planted by the Dutch. So we've got them to thank for that. They planted the pine forest to drain the marshland of the Medoc. Um, the Medoc was all marshy and they, plant, they, they built dikes and they planted the pine forest, which then allowed the, the, the area to grow grapes. And now the pine forest works as a natural a barrier against storms and strong winds, uh, coastal strong winds. So very important factor. And I can quite often when I'm tasting red wines, particularly from the Medoc, I can convince myself I can smell a bit of pine in there. Uh, different soil types around the region. As I said, it is a large region, so there are different soil types which allow for the different grape varieties to be planted. So in the left bank, we have uh, the gravel, which is key for Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, those, that big bit, if you can remember the map, uh, between the two rivers is clay and limestone, so good for Merlot, also for Sauvignon Blanc. And on the right bank, you've got clay, limestone, clay and limestone mostly, but then you get these lovely outcrops of gravelly soils, sandy soils, which allow for Cabernet Franc particularly, and also some Cabernet Sauvignon. So our gravelly soil there, absolutely key in the Medoc. And you've got different gravelly soils. You've got the Garonnaise gravel, which comes from the Garonne um, River. And you've also got Pyrenean gravel coming from that through rivers uh, from the Pyrenean mountains. Um, when you go down the Medoc and you see that white, white vineyards, it's not chalk like it might be in Champagne, it's the gravel. And those tend to be the best vineyards. So those lovely stones that will heat up the Cabernet Sauvignon grape, which is going to only ripen marginally. It's uh, pretty far north uh, Bordeaux for Cabernet Sauvignon, so really needs that gravelly soil. There's our clay and limestone soil. And finally, the uh, right bank. Great varieties. So this is generally a slide that surprises even people who know Bordeaux quite well is that percentage of Merlot is huge and increasing. So this is, it is Cabernet Sauvignon country, but really only in the Medoc is where it dominates. And even in the Medoc, increasingly, Merlot is uh, gaining importance. Um, quite a few vineyards now, if they're replanting, they will replant with Cabernet rather than Merlot. Several reasons for this. Merlot, yes, it does suffer from, um, mildew but it's an early ripening grape it's a trendy grape it's it's easy to appreciate doesn't need such long aging so you can see why people might um, plant merlot in, instead of uh, cabernet sauvignon but cabernet sauvignon in the top vineyards is still the key grape variety um, really great for um, its structure, its uh, age potential, wonderful uh, aromas. It really needs Merlot though uh, to balance it out. 
and a little bit of the lovely Cabernet Franc, which is also gaining a bit more, not necessarily in, um, in the left bank, but in other parts in the court and in the right bank, Cabernet Franc is increasing in, in importance. From my point of view, a really good thing because I think the aromas are delicious. Um, and then you have a little bit of Carmenere and Malbec, particularly in the Côte, Côte de Blaye, uh, Côte de Bourg, and Petit Verdot, which you do see um, in the Medoc, a little bit of seasoning. It's rarely more than four to seven percent of um, a blend. And there they are, our lovely Merlot, that blue-black Cabernet Sauvignon with thick skins, and its father, Cabernet Franc. In terms of white grape varieties, um, Semillon is losing out to Sauvignon. They now are equal, whereas Semillon was always the more planted white grape variety for the sweet wines. Uh, but because Sauvignon Blanc is so trendy, and there's a lot of research going on in, um, done by the CIVB to get the best aromas from Sauvignon Blanc in Bordeaux. Uh, that more and more people are planting it. And I don't know whether you guys drink uh, Sauvignon from um, Bordeaux. I would urge you to. They're so fresh and um, elegant and understated, even at the cheaper end, I would really recommend it. And now that uh, people can label their Bordeaux Blanc or their Entre de Mer, they can all, uh, label it as Sauvignon Blanc, uh, they should be getting a little bit more recognition, I think, from the consumer. Very different from New Zealand, um, but, you know, there's room for everybody, and I think they really show well. Semillon is obviously a key go great variety for the sweet wines. And then Muscadel, um, used a lot in Entre de Mer for when all three grapes are blended together for just a really fruity, easy drinking wine, but also a little bit in the sweet wines. And then Sauvignon Gris, a mutation of uh, Sauvignon Blanc, one or two hundred percent Sauvignon Gris uh, in Bordeaux. Colombard and Uni Blanc, um, hardly used at all. Sauvignon there, very different from our uh, thicker skinned um, Semillons and little Muscatels, but more um, sugar dominated and um, softer skins and our botrytis grapes for our sauternes. So just looking, showing you, I love this slide because it shows so well how you absolutely have to pick by hand. If you look at the middle photograph, how that bunch is really in the evolution of the botrytis. So you could pick one or two of those grapes, but you'd want to leave the others on for um, picking when they are like the, the last one. You may have heard that there are some new authorised grapes in Bordeaux. They are doing this to, um, well, research and to work towards what they might need to, to be doing or might need to be planting many years from now uh, with climate change. They have decided that they don't want any grape varieties that are recognised from a different area. So, for example, they wouldn't plant Syrah because that's the great variety of the Rhone. They won't plant Pinot Noir because that's the great variety of uh, Burgundy. They will plant um, a couple there from um, Portugal, Tariga Nacional and Alvarinho. But they are, at the moment, you can plant them and use them in Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur up to 10%. So it really is just research, okay? And um, it can, they can only com um, comprise 5% of your vineyard. But it shows you that they are looking ahead. All wine regions are doing this. They are looking ahead at what uh, will happen to their wine region with, with climate change. Bearing in mind, if you add these great varieties, you, you've still got to keep what we recognise as the identity under the appellation of what Bordeaux is as a wine. Now, they are also working very hard, like other wine regions, in terms of their sustainability. Um, they are looking to reduce pesticides very much looking to, to promote this living side by side. I don't know if you remember in the news a few years ago how 
children going to school in the region where they are producing Prosecco were suffering because of the spraying in the vineyards. This is what it means by living side by side. You've got to think about who's around you, what's around you, um, only spray when you need to. That's really helped by um, several things that they're doing, um, helped by the CIBB with research and development, like weather stations, so you know what's coming, you only spray when you need to. I mean, it seems odd to us maybe, but 20 years ago, people would just spray. You know, it would be that week and you would spray. Now they spray only um, as they need to. I don't know why that's come up. Can you see that on your screen, that squiggle? I haven't done anything and I have no idea why that's come up. I'm not technical, so I don't know how to remove it either. So forgive me. <laughs> Um, the weather stations and also soil mapping are uh, really important. Biodiversity, you'll see increasingly um, plants grown within the uh, vineyards and people looking after their carbon foot footprint by reducing the amount of water they use. There's a lot of water used in um, wineries, um, but people really keeping a check on, on there. And this idea that the vineyard only belongs to you, well, in fact, it doesn't belong to you, you are just looking after it for the next generation. That's the, the key message. And the way they're doing that, I'm really sorry about that squiggle, I don't know how that has come there, um, is by trying to get all wineries to be certifi certified, ah, oh, somebody's removed it, um, certified uh, in some way by working environmentally uh, in an environmentally friendly uh, manner. So um, the two, I'm gonna say the easiest levels, Terra Vitas and um, Haute Valeur uh, Environmentale, HVE, um, where they will be, if we look at the Terra Vitas, looking at the biodiversity, uh, plant health, reducing the amount of uh, insecticides and pesticides that they use, um, look, reducing the amount of uh, water. Um, this, is, this is used, this is, this is, uh, people do um, get themselves certified with Terra Vitas, but at the moment, if you're going to Terra Vitas, you may as well go to the next level, which is the HVE, and it's more highly regarded by those people who know. Uh, so at the moment in Bordeaux, there's only uh, 91 uh, wineries with Terra Vitas, um, and most are going to the HVE. And if I can just explain that um, people are doing this because it's asked of them to do what they can in their vineyard to be more uh, sustainable. You know, lutte raisonnée, sustainable agriculture, has been a thing for the last 15, 20 years, but this is taking it to the next level. It costs them, it costs the winery money. It costs them an awful lot of time. If you've ever worked in France, you know the paperwork that's involved in anything. A lot of paperwork, um, a lot of time and effort, but people are really keen to, to do this. Uh, they can see the benefits. So at the moment, um, there's 359 uh, wineries in uh, Bordeaux with the H. VE certification. Um, that's out of 783 in France, so they're doing pretty well with, with that in Bordeaux. It's definitely the main um, step that people are taking uh, to become more environmentally friendly. There is the next level of organic viticulture, but being organic in Bordeaux is hard. You know, it rains a lot in Bordeaux. When you get rain, you get mildew, and, and Merlot is pretty susceptible to that. So um, I think you can be organic and biodynamic if you are very small um, or alternatively if you have an awful lot of, or if your wine sell you know, at very high prices therefore you've got the, the funds to, to do it. I'm sure you know about um, all organic viticulture, it's um, no pesticides, um, limited use of sulfur etc. Um, 640 um, wineries, not necessarily certified, but undergoing conversion. You know, it takes seven years before you're allowed to have your uh, certification. Um, 
dotted around the whole of Bordeaux, but quite a lot in the Medoc actually. And biodynamic, even fewer. And these are the ones, you know, people do often ask me about biodynamic viticulture, but it's basically because of Ponte Cane, uh, who was um, one of the first to, uh, to be certified and to really push it and the price of their wines kind of doubled and the wine is, is really good. But now you've got uh, Chateau Palmer and Brand Contenac and there's, there's quite a few um, producers that are now biodynamic. Still only 47 uh, vineyards in Bordeaux and I don't know how quickly that will grow. It is very hard work to, um, to work biodynamically also um, organically. If it is your thing, and I can see there are a lot of people here, so um, some of you might be very passionate about organic and biodynamic. I'm going to tell you about a chateau that I visited. I'd never heard of them. Um, bearing in mind there are many, many different chateaus um, in um, Bordeaux and brands. Um, this one is called Chateau Coutet. So just like Chateau Couté, the same name of Chateau Couté in um, Sauternes, but they pronounce theirs Coutet, no relation, they're not in any way um, uh, related. Um, this is Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, it's just uh, northwest of um, Saint-Emilion, nine hectare vineyard, been in the family um, for about four, 400 years, I think, 500 years. It's bi uh, biodynamic. It has never, ever had any insecticide or herbicide in its uh, vineyard. So its soil is pure and clean. It's also, the, the wine is delicious. Not massively expensive, saint million Grand Cru, it's about 20 euros. Um, it also has its own chapel and uh, a, a Pope from years ago visited, they're very proud, it's a tiny little chapel, um, very beautiful, they've re uh, recently restored it, so very, very much worth a visit uh, if you get over to Bordeaux when Covid is uh, behind us. So the important thing to note with Bordeaux is at the moment 60% of Bordeaux producers can claim to have a certification um, of being environmentally friendly, um, but they're looking um, to make that 100% in the next five years. So they are definitely heading in the right direction. Um, Bordeaux itself, uh, the CIVB is helping. I mean, they are creating a lot of paperwork for the wineries, but they are helping um, people work towards that healthier vineyard with all the works that they're doing, all the research that, that they are doing. So looking a little bit of um, the seven families and how they are um, bear up in terms of the amount that they produce. So as I mentioned, nearly half is Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur. So affordable Bordeaux, 2% is the expensive stuff. Okay, so even in the Medoc where you get the um, Grand Cru Class A's, um, they're still very good, affordable Medocs, Alt Medocs, even um, some of the communes like Margot and Poyax, you can still, you know, they can, you can still buy them at, at 15, 20 pounds. So the really expensive wines only account for 2%. It's fantastic because it's given Bordeaux its reputation, but, um, you know, it, it, people mustn't concentrate solely on that because there is a lot more uh, to, that it uh, can offer. Um, on the right bank, saint emilion um, Franzac, Pomerol, where Merlot dominates, Merlot, Cabernet, Franc blends at uh, 11%. Um, the Court, now Court de Bordeaux, these are um, several different courts around the region that have all come under one umbrella, Court de Bordeaux, because if you had put on a, a wine label, for example, um, Saint-Macaire, as I mentioned before, it wouldn't have meant anything to anybody. So now they can put uh, Côte de Bordeaux, Saint-Macaire, 
and it, it relates it back to Bordeaux and so people understand a little bit uh, as to uh, how it might um, taste, represent really good value. And it's where you might find the kind of unusual ones like 100% Malbec or 100% Cabernet Franc, which you generally don't get um, in other um, areas. So look out for those. Um, the Bordeaux Blanc uh, doesn't, in that 7% is not including white grave. Uh, because that's got its own little family, but 7% of Bordeaux Blanc. And then Grave and Sauterne, they've lumped themselves together because they feel that they, they have an identity of being left bank, south of Bordeaux. Uh, Grave produces uh, wonderful reds, whites, uh, sweet whites. Grave Supérieur is an appellation for uh, medium sweet white wines and then of course you've got the very sweet wines of Sauterne and then the uh, Blanc Doux sweet um, will be things like um, Lupiac, Serrance and um, um, Côte de Bordeaux, um, Premier Côte de Bordeaux, sweeter wines but not as sweet as Sauterne so around the sort of 40-50 grams of residual sugar rather than the 100 grams of residual sugar that you have in Sauterne. And what we've got now that is so exciting is the rosé uh, production that has um, increased dramatically in recent times. A lot to do with English producers, actually. British producers uh, producing wine over there. I'm thinking particularly of Chateau de Source. Uh, Martin Krajowski was one of the first to produce and really market uh, and be proud of uh, a Bordeaux rosé in the lighter style, the sort of paler pink rather than the, the darker styles that you get in, um, I don't know, say Navarra. So very pale pink and made purposely. So rosé has been made in Bordeaux, um, but quietly and not really marketed and really done as a byproduct for the red wine. So they would draw off juice to concentrate the red wine and have a little bit of rosé because they've drawn some juice off. Not really the best way to make rosé. Now they are making wine purposely and a lot of the top chateaus are making really lovely uh, rosé wines. Definitely can recommend those. Now Cremant, um, even five years ago, I would sort of do a Bordeaux presentation and say, yeah, it makes a bit of sparkling wine, but let's move on uh, because not that exciting. My goodness, in the last five years, what has just happened? For a start, many more people are making Camel um, and the quality has just gone through the roof. So you can make it from any of the great varieties that we saw. So you could have a Semillon, you could have a Cabernet Franc, you could have a Semillon Sauvignon blend uh, down entirely to the producer. Obviously, because it's Cremant, it must uh, be made by the traditional method and it must be sur lat uh, aged for 12 months, a minimum of 12 months. So I would urge you to, to look out for those. I mean, an easy one to find uh, is a big brand, Calvi. Um, it's great, it's about a tenner and it's really lovely and fruity. So look out for that. So changes in Bordeaux, who would have thunk it? Now looking at, um, Bordeaux on wine lists and in restaurants. Bordeaux, <clears throat> as, as I've sort of already, I think, hopefully um, explained, there is a wine for every occasion and every dish. So Bordeaux is very much a food wine, even the rosés. A few years ago, Bordeaux did a marketing um, campaign, which was good food would choose Bordeaux and Bordeaux really does lend itself to be um, consumed with food. It has uh, acidity in both the whites and the reds, it has structure in both the whites and the red, uh, tannic uh, backbone structure, everything you need to really work well with food. And as I've mentioned, you've got every pr price point. So it can be an everyday Bordeaux, you know, an ordinary Bordeaux or Bordeaux Supérieur, uh, right the way through to the world's your limit, basically, you know, 2,000 pounds a bottle. 
and the same for every stage of your life and also the wine's life. One of the things I think is interesting for people to put Bordeaux on their wine list now is that the younger generation don't necessarily know Bordeaux. So it could be seen as a, um, a, a new wine. So when I started in the wine trade <clears throat> many years ago, I won't say how many, there would be at least half a dozen Bordeaux wines on your list, at least. Now, it's not, you know, it's not obligatory, but I would suggest that you have got the option for Cremant, you've got the option for an aperitif white, you've got an option for a, a foodie white, you've got an option for rosé, easy drinking red, right the way through to serious um, uh, red Bordeaux. In terms of the food uh, and wine matching principles, you know them. Uh, obviously, I always say to people, you drink your wine with the, you drink what you want with the, the food that you're um, eating. It's entirely up to you. We all have different palates, but obviously we know what generally works well as a pairing. And we can't do this in the UK, this regional pairing of having the local dish with the local wine. I've never quite worked out which came first, the wine or the dish. If anybody knows, please tell me. But it is absolutely true that, for example, the oysters from Arcachon just work perfectly. Well, they've put their entre de mer. I would definitely be going for a Pesat Lyon, but you know, the wine works really well with the dish. And there they've got lamb from Poyac with a wine from, from the region. And also um, confit de canard is a local dish for Saint-Emilion. It just works perfectly with, uh, with the um, uh, wines from Saint-Emilion. But we shouldn't forget when we're food and wine matching, the fact that the texture and the weight of the wine to go with the weight of the dish. And not only that, but the complexity within that wine. So if you're having a simple, I don't know, sausage and mash, you don't want something with loads of different um, layers of aromas and flavors because they will detract from each other. You want something to match that, that would suit each other. So sausage and mash with a nice, uh, simple Bordeaux Supérieur or, or a um, cut wine and something really beautifully complex with a lovely sauce with something more like um, your Grand Cru Classes. Um, <clears throat> I always need to talk about sweet wines because it's a passion. This, here we've got similarity um, of pairing where you're choosing a sweet wine, in this case, Saint Croix du Mont, with a sweet dessert. Um, I think saint Croix du Mont goes beautifully, apricot tart they suggested, but lemon meringue pie is also absolutely wonderful. So like with like, sweet and sweet. But actually my absolute favorite is Sauterne and Roquefort. So contrast, you have the Sauterne, which is sweet and the Roquefort that is salty. So try those, um, uh, contrast as well and because we have the different varieties you can try them with lots of different dishes. I'm sure you all know how well uh, white wine goes with um, cheeses these days. Um, it's something that everybody does. I mean one of the wonderful things about Bordeaux is that all their wines uh, work with cheese so the red does work with cheese. The wonderful whites work with Comté and uh, salty cheeses and then of course the Sauternes uh, do too. Um, here's, I think, quite a useful slide to, if you're matching, trying to match wine with a difficult dish, um, where should you go? So artichokes, you know, have a lot of bitterness. So you want something that's not too tannic, more supple. So a Merlot base rather than a um, Cabernet Sauvignon or a Cabernet Franc style of wine. I'm sure you have your own um, ideas on that. And just to finish off, why should you have Bordeaux on your wine list now? Well, as I said at the beginning, quality has never been so high. And that's absolutely true. Um, down to the 
what we saw with sustainability with the viticulture but also in the winery but also we've been extremely lucky with vintages recently so if you go back 10 years well 11 years 9 10 11 was okay it wasn't wonderful 12 delicious 13 maybe not so much but 14 15 16 17 18 all amazing vintages i haven't been lucky enough to try the 19s because of uh, covid but i can't wait they're seemingly very good but we have been very lucky the vintages are different they haven't delivered the same thing every year so the wines are um good quality for different reasons but the the vintages have been really good um like everywhere bordeaux alcohol levels have risen a little bit but they still tend to be less than you will find in a lot of new world countries so we're looking at it used to be 12 and a half actually you can still get some bordeaux that's 11 and a half but uh, generally um that you will find whites and reds around 13 13 and a half it's rare when it goes up to 14 happens but it's rare and generally they do take it you know that the wine does take the higher alcohol if it has it so as i mentioned they're very food friendly wines they do represent good value we need to move away from this idea of thinking that bordeaux is only expensive wines and if you want to I'll, i can prove it to you by uh, you heading over to bordeaux.com where you'll find the hot 50 where we've um, chosen the 50 uh, best value uh, wines on the UK market at the moment. Sustainability, we talked about the diversity and the choice. So they may not be um, on everybody's wine list, but I can tell you they're in everybody's uh, portfolio in terms of importers and um, retailers uh, and wholesalers. So do look out for them. Um, on the retail market and I think that's about it so I stopped sharing right thank you so much Laura I think that's so clear and covers so many uh, details that we would like uh, to share with our audience and this is so because this is so clear, I actually only received uh, two questions. I think Yutaka already, oh, okay, Yutaka has got another one, just add it. So we'll start with Yutaka's question, if it's okay. So why does Left Bank seem to prefer more double guyo, while Right Bank seem to prefer more single guyo? Is it Ms. something? Oh, well, there we're going, getting very, very um, technical in, in vine growing. Um, I think it's more to do with the grape variety that's planted. So Cabernet Sauvignon favouring the double Guyot and Merlot, the, the single, um, why that would be. Um, <clears throat> the double also, you're allowing, I don't know, a little bit more working with the soils of the gravel, gravelly soils in the Medoc too. So helpful for the um, ripening of the Cabernet Sauvignon. <clears throat> not sure that I've got a more uh, detailed answer than that, but I can definitely look it up and uh, e I'll email it to you, Leona. Okay, I can share with everyone. Okay. And so two more questions and uh, because of the time, uh, you know, I'm conscious about the time. So one is, uh, is natural wine a thing in Bordeaux? <laughs> Virtually not. Um, I, know, I know there is, um, I think there's one or two, but really not at all. So you notice there wasn't anything about natural wine in the, um, in the sustainable um, slides. It, it's really not a thing. Okay. And the next question is, the last question is, if you were asked to, uh, for a new restaurant to recommend three border wines on the list, from different price point, what would you recommend? I think you cover a little bit, but I think probably it's just uh, to give a, another example. <coughs> you wise, price point? Well, I'm going to, rather than um, suggest a particular chateau, um, because that's kind of quite difficult to do because there are so many, um, I'm going to suggest a 
a style. So if I was doing three Bordeaux on my list, I would have a Bordeaux Supérieur, which I should have said Bordeaux Supérieur obviously has a, an extra quality level and also has to be aged for nine months before bottling. Um, so I would go for a Bordeaux Supérieur. Um, depending on my restaurant, I would probably go for a Cru Bourgeois from the Medoc because I think you get a lot of value then. And I absolutely would insist upon a, um, a white um, from Grave or Pezat Léonion. Thank you so much, Laura. I think a lot of people also ask if whether or not you are able to share the PowerPoint. And if it's possible, I think we can we can take this offline, of course. And yeah, so. Um, I can, sh I'm happy to share the PowerPoint, but it is copyrighted, so you're not allowed to use it, if you know what I mean. You can have it for your information, but you're not supposed to use it. Um, so, if you can all promise me that you won't use it then, because it's it's the, the CIVBs and I don't know why, but they're very, very strict about it. Yeah, okay, no problem at all, I'll remind everyone. <laughs> okay, and I'm really sorry about the um, technical difficulties right at the beginning, um, and uh, the video is quite fun just to uh, to watch um, if you want to get the PowerPoint. So we will share the link to everyone. And once again, this session is recorded as well. So I will be sharing the link, uh, you know, for those one who join a little bit late to catch up as well. So thank you everyone. And thank you especially to Laura. And I think it's a great session. I learned a lot. I hope everyone does too. Okay. So thank you to see everyone again next Monday. And thank you once again, Laura. That's been great. Thank you.